Hello ladies and gentlemen and thanks for tuning in to Crashy News where we bring you the latest in Crash Bandicoot news and updates. This is Wapajem taking over the narration once again here to welcome you to this channel very first game review. Since 2017, after a long period of pure silence, the Crash Bandicoot series came back to the gaming landscape through successful remakes of the original Naughty Dog games. But as great as these remakes may be, they didn't suffice to fully materialize this franchise revival. Crash needed a brand new game to prove that the series can progress forward It doesn't have to rely entirely on the nostalgic value of its past works in order to succeed. And this is what's being attempted with Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. Special thanks to Activision for providing the review code for the game. Developed by Toys for Bob, which we owe the Spyro Reignited trilogy, this new title is treated as an evolution of the classic formula, building upon it by expanding the scope and complementing it with new mechanics. With that said, many questions arise, which are, does it actually stand up? Does it live up to the expectations built in the past few months or even several years of waiting? And can it be considered the best Crash game since the departure of Naughty Dog at the very least? Well, we'll find out the answers together. Let's review Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. As the number 4 win fly, this game's story picks up after the events of Crash Warped. After being imprisoned into an unknown world for over two decades, Cortex and Entropy manages to escape thanks to Uka Uka opening a rift in the fabric of space and time, leaving him behind as he fell into a deep sleep. Seizing the opportunity, Entropy begins building a machine called the Rift Generator to open more doors into time and alternate realities as he and Cortex attempt to embark into an all-out conquest of the multiverse. Thankfully, the dimensional disruption also awakens the quantum masks, the guardians of time and space, from a long slumber that are scattered too far apart from each other to be able to fix this monumental problem. That's where Crash Bandicoot and her sister Coco comes to the scene, as they'll have to reunite the quantum masks by traveling through different dimensions, which each brings them face to face with several figures of their past, whether it will be as a friend or foe. While this is nothing new to the series, this new entry adopts a narrative structure that differs and expands further than the original trilogy in which it's a direct sequel to ever did. It's not just an intro, an outro, and a bunch of talking heads in between. There's legit cutscenes all throughout the game built into the settings with characters interacting face to face with each other and situations actually happening. I can recall so many witty lines and corny moments that left a big smile on my face, sometimes an out loud laugh which is elevated by the great voice performances despite the lack of familiar faces in the cast. One character in particular absolutely steals the show for me whenever he's on screen, but I'll give to him in a moment. With all that positivity however, it's not perfect, <laughs> and nothing that deep. Many story details are delivered impetuously when they could be expanded upon a little more, and there's a cliche that feels kinda tiring and makes what the story already alluded to even less surprising. What did surprise me is the ending. I won't specify too much to keep it spoiler free, but pretty much, when you think this climax has settled and we've come to the conclusion, the game actually keeps going and throws a major curveball that chips focus entirely. It's a nice surprise that leads to cool callbacks and makes perfect sense with the story key concept. Overall, it's a pretty decent story with plenty of fun moments and serves the game perfectly. If you're familiar with any of the classic PS1 games, it seems like your usual affair. Traversing a bunch of linear levels, avoiding hazards, collecting fruit, dying in a funny slapstick way, breaking all the crates to earn gems, all that good stuff. And sure, it takes that same basis, but it actually differs in various ways from before, while expanding upon that basis to make it evolve. First thing to address here is the controls. In theory, Crash keeps his established moveset of spinning, sliding, and ground pounding, which is then coupled with the double jump ability from Warped, as well as whole new abilities like riding on rails, wall running, and rope swinging. Not to mention that her sister Coco, also playable at any time, shares that same moveset. However, the movement and physics are different from how Crash felt in the original trilogy and its insane equivalent. But don't take it as a negative, it actually differs in a good way. Crash and Coco not only feel very snappy and responsive, but you're gaining plenty of control over your momentum. 
double jumping not only gives you extra height, but also allows you to cancel momentum so you can quickly recorrect yourself and land precisely on where you wanted to jump on. It is also helped by this little circle that serves as the advanced shadow, which you can disable if you find it too distracting. Even the slide, which I complained about in the demo, I've actually came to recognize its strength as you keep your vertical height in the air for as long as you hold that slide. This slide, coupled with the double jumping, allows you to traverse bigger gaps than you will ever be able to do with the basic moveset of a Crash game before. Not to mention that unlike the original trilogy, Crash's controls feels fully optimized for the analog stick, giving even more precision with your jumps. But those satisfyingly precise controls don't mean anything if you don't have good level design to back it up and make for good overall gameplay. And thankfully for us, it's delivered in spades. Let me tell you upfront that aside of boss battles, every single level in this game is core platforming at its purest. There are sometimes mid-level phases like the jet board and animal riding, but no level is solely focused around a gimmick that distracts from the main attraction. And not only are the levels longer, but they are also expanded in scope, to the point where you'll come across some segments where you have more wiggle room to walk around. But the bigger length and scope doesn't mean there's a bunch of dead air. It's actually very tight and condensed throughout. You're always on your toes. And it's built so organically that it no longer feels like corridors anymore. One thing about the controls that I don't like is how the aforementioned mid-level phases feels. The animal riding feels too loose and slippery for my liking, and the jetboard does not cooperate well with currents. In both cases, I'm losing my sense of direction at the simplest turn. But wait, I'm not done talking about the gameplay yet, because there's some novel concepts I should address that elevates the game even more so. Remember the aforementioned quantum masks? Well, when you encounter one of them in a level, they become equipped into you as a suit and grants its reality-bending powers, leading to some pretty wild level segments. There's Lani Loli, who can face shift various objects, crates, and obstacles in and out of existence. Then there's Akano, who draws its power from dark matter and turns you into a whirlwind of energy, so you can traverse even longer gaps with the double jump and break reinforced crates with ease. However, he's weak to TNT. There's Kapunowa, who can't slow down time, so you can jump across fast moving platforms, avoid fast enemies, and even allows you to walk on nitro crates. And finally, you have Ika Ika who can flip the direction of gravity, thus going from walking on the floor to walking under the ceiling. All of these mask abilities can be activated at the simple press of a button, and pressing that same button again will cancel it in the case of Akano and Kupunowa. But the novelty doesn't stop at new masks. You can also take control of 10 favorite characters over with the leading Bandicoot siblings. They're playable in timeline levels, which are unlocked after clearing a core level and serves to explain key moments in those levels from a different perspective. Each character you play in them have their own unique moveset, all relying on their respective tools. The first among them is none other than Tana. Well, more so an alternate version from a dimension where she had to fend for herself and became a lone wolf. Her signature abilities are a trusty hookshot to reach out places, break crates, and take down enemies from a distance, as well as wall jumping in certain spots. And I'll be frank here, she's my least favorite of the bunch. She's definitely fun to play as, don't get me wrong, and I like her character well enough. She's just the least distinct from Crash and Coco in terms of gameplay, and I think her abilities are too situational. Or at least it feels more apparent compared to the other characters, such as Dingo Dial. Oh boy, now this guy is where I had the most fun with. Retired from villainy as he traded his flamethrower for a vacuum gun and decided to open his own dinner, he scouted to the middle of his dimensional disruption after seeing the destruction of his beloved dinner. Dingo's vacuum gun is very versatile in its functions. You can hold the jump button to hover in the air for a short time, to then get an extra boost in height as he aims his gun down. And you can of course suck various things such as barrels and crates of TNTs, to then shoot them back at targets and blow them up to smithereens. Very satisfying, although it would have been nice to have a reticle to aim more precisely. And finally, we have Dr. Neocortex himself. His levels are more puzzle oriented, as you would use his famous ray gun to turn enemies into regular or bouncing platforms to help you with the legwork, as you only have a mid air dash to compensate for the lack of a double jump. Unsurprisingly for longtime fans, we're getting yet another shift in art direction reflecting on the studio in charge, and it sure shook a vocal minority. But in my opinion, this new artistic take on the Crash universe is a genuinely big step up from the misdirected take that the Insane Trilogy took. 
You can instantly recognize this is Toys for Bob's newly found art style with the soft gradients and the embrace of wonky scenery with lush details that you can find in the Spiral Reignited trilogy. However, it does have its distinct qualities, mainly the animation and how squishy, stretchy, and snappy it can get to emulate that Looney Tunes feel it tries to replicate. And that doesn't stop at the cinematics, it also applies to the gameplay as well. It just looks so clean and built so organically. I swear, screenshots of this game could be mistaken for actual concept art at times with these deep, wide vistas. As for the music, well, I must admit that when I first heard some of it before release, I felt very mixed. It felt too dainty and muddled at first compared to Just Mansell's work. But after hearing the whole thing, I not only come to recognize some really catchy, energetic highlights, but I've come to understand the direction they're going with. For the most part, the music aims more for being ambient and setting the mood of the level, with the melodies being significantly amped up in key segments like riding and chases. This dynamic scoring could be compared to the score of a feature film, and in the context of the game, which has a much more prominent narrative, it does make sense. Still leaves with one of the weakest title themes in the whole series though. One big hiccup though about the presentation, which also happens to tie with gameplay, is the performance. Unlike Insane and Nitro Fueled, which both had a 30 FPS cap, the frame rate is actually unlocked, which is great for people who own enhanced models like the PS4 Pro, but that also means that base console owners, like me, will have to endure through in a consistent performance. On base PS4, it generally performs around the region of 40 frames per second. There's some parts when it manages to hit 60 FPS, like the the less demanding 2D segments, but there's also some parts, mainly the cutscenes rendered in engine where it gets horrendously choppy. So yeah, this game will lean on both sides of the spectrum on base consoles. This is definitely a title that will benefit most of the backwards compatibility feature the upcoming next-gen consoles will provide this year. For all the skeptics who believe this game doesn't have enough content for the asking price, let me reassure you that you'll be getting the most out of your buck for better or for worse. This game is not only long, it's also hard. Really hard. Let's just say there's a reason why the modern mode with infinite lives is recommended over retro mode. To put it to perspective, I spent around 15 hours to reach the end of the main story. You could 100% complete the original PS1 trilogy in that time frame. Immediately, I tried to get the crate gem in every level, thus spent a lot of time on them. One piece of advice, do not try to complete everything on your first go. This is the kind of game that requires multiple runs for completionists. So what exactly do you get in terms of content? Well, you get through 38 levels and 5 boss battles to be found in the dimensional map. Sure, the level count seems to be just a little more than it warped, but keep in mind, the levels in Crash 4 are longer than usual. In each level, there's six different gems to collect, each with their own earning condition. The first three for collecting 40, 60, and 80% of the fruits, the fourth one for breaking all the crates, the fifth one for clearing the level without dying more than three times, and the sixth one is hidden within the level itself. But wait, there's more! After completing the second boss battle, you'll unlock Inverted Mode. This is a new take on the Mirror Mode concept, where you revisit levels not only with the perspective mirrored, but a unique visual filter for each dimension, sometimes influencing the gameplay itself. And these inverted versions of levels each have their own set of gems, essentially doubling how many of the jewels you can collect in a stage. And that's good, because if you collect enough gems in both a normal and inverted playthrough of a level, you'll unlock a new cosmetic skin for either Crash or Coco. Yes, you can give your Bandicoot a new sense of style. So many good looking ones. Most of them are unlocked by eating a level gem's threshold, while some are unlocked by completing a specific challenge. But wait, I'm not done yet! If you reach a certain spot in a level without dying once, you'll collect a flashback tape. These flashback tapes are presented as archived recordings in Cortex's test chambers, meant to tell more about the origins of Crash and even Coco. There's 21 tapes to collect, and they each give you access to a bonus-like 2D level, where you'll be tackling some challenging crate puzzles while Cortex and his colleagues comment over your feats or failings. Once cleared, you'll receive an emblem, and you can even get a gold emblem for breaking 99% of the crates, and a platinum emblem for breaking them all. And I haven't even mentioned the time trials which now implements ghost runs to give you immediate feedback, the secret colored gems to collect, the concept art gallery, the integrated pass and play mode for alternative co-op, and the Bandicoot battle modes for competitive multiplayer. Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is indeed the true evolution. 
And it does a whopper job of that. It actually manages to expand the classic formula to another level and refreshing it with new mechanics and ideas without altering its very foundations. It is all wrapped up with a great ton of content, beautiful visuals, and a decent story with plenty of fun moments to giggle at. It is also a highly difficult game. It looks very intimidating for anyone who's willing to go the full-on completionist route. But with all the arrow pulling I did, I would be lying if I said it didn't feel satisfying when I conquered those tough moments and if it wasn't a really fun journey. While I was writing this review, I've heard so many people say this is the best Crash game ever made. And while I've yet to determine if that's actually the case, I can safely claim it is the best post Naughty Dog title by a very long shot. Who knows if after this game, the franchise can keep up the pace, or if it will fall flat on its face once again, but I feel incredibly satisfied that the series finally reached the peak that Naughty Dog has set a long time ago, and that those who followed after were too far to even tickle it. I'm giving Crash Bandicoot 4 it's about time, and 8.5 out of 10. That's all we have for today. We hope you liked this review of Crash 4. If you did, be sure to leave a like, share the video, and subscribe to this channel to keep up with future updates. For more regular coverage, also check the Crashy News website and follow us on social media. You can also support us directly by leaving a donation on our coffee page. Links in the description below. This is Crashy News signing out. Have a good day.